Hypersonic missiles travel five times faster than the speed of sound and are harder to detect than ballistic missiles. The development of these high-speed weapons is becoming a bigger part of the Missile Defense Agency's strategy and spending. Vice Admiral John Hill is director of the Missile Defense Agency. Admiral, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, great to be here. I want to start with defending against hypersonic missiles, because as I said, besides them going much faster, so at least five times the speed of sound, what makes defending against them different from ballistic missiles? Uh, so ballistic missiles in the end game, uh, when they come out of the atmosphere, if we have not defeated them at that point, are already at hypersonic speeds. So speed really reduces your reaction time. And so that's, that's a key factor, number one. Uh, number two, what makes these different from ballistic missiles is the maneuver. So they are maneuvering uh, along the edge of the space, and once they come into the atmosphere, they're also maneuvering there at those very high speeds that you mentioned. So that, that's the key difference. It's maneuver and speed. Okay, so if they're, the hypersonics are maneuverable, um, they're much faster, so then how do you defend against them, getting, getting, them, getting a sensor on them and then tracking them? Right, so we have sensors today that can detect uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, the problem with the sensor architecture that we have is it's stationary, right? So if you take a look at the field of view of a radar, uh, if we're lucky enough to catch the hypersonic flying through that field of view, then we can get a track. If we happen to have a ship in the right place that is maneuvering and following the track, we can get some portion of that track. What we lack is the full track continuity. And so really the only way to do that for a maneuvering threat is to look down from space. And so that drives us to build out a space architecture that can look down and see these targets across the globe. Because where they're really maneuvering is in what we call the glide phase. So they can be ballistically launched, they can be cruise missile launched, they can be aircraft launched. But when they're along that glide phase at the edge of the atmosphere, that's when they do these large lateral maneuvers, specifically to avoid the sensors that we talked about, those stationary sensors that have a limited field of view. So the only way to really counter that is to look down from space. And then the challenge is hot target against a warm earth. And so you have to have exquisite algorithms to extract those targets out of that scene. Uh, so it's not a, uh, a challenge that we can't meet. Uh, we have proven on the ground that we can do that. The next step is to go to space to prove that we can, in fact, uh, process that data and bring it down quickly so that we can get it to an engaging unit. So then what's the timeline for that? When would we have that capability? So we, we are actually um, pacifying uh, two demo satellites that we've had up for a fairly long time. That, that was really the prototype and demoing of, of what we're calling the hypersonic ballistic tracking space sensor, HBTSS. And the reason we have both an H and a B uh, in the HBTSS acronym is H is for hypersonics. Um, those That demo uh, will be uh, uh, up in space in uh, FY23, so a year from now, about this time frame, we'll be launching the first two, and we'll put them in an inclination where we can benefit from that data in the primary areas where we do test. And so we'll be pulling that data down and then processing it quickly and then measuring our ability to get it to a, a shooting unit. Um, so that's, that's really the timeline we're on, is, is to demo in 23. What was your reaction to the successful uh, Chinese hypersonic missile test? from last year? Uh, so there have been a few. In fact, there have been a, a large number of those, uh, both from China, from Russia, and even claimed by North Korea most recently. Um, we are able to collect data. Um, so we're not starting from zero. You know, when we talk about uh, deploying a space capability uh, first time in 23, uh, we do leverage today's capability that we have out there now. So we do have overhead persistent uh, infrared sensors that we use right now in ballistic uh, missile defense for that indications and warning, that first flash, we, we can see those. Uh, we can also see, you know, parts of the flight uh, with those constellations today. And then, as I mentioned, you have land-based radars and we have uh, sea-based, uh, ship-based radars that are out there doing that tracking. But I wonder if that that successful test changed anything for you. I mean, what was your your personal reaction, and then what was the did things change for you in in the mission itself? Yes, I think I think it's changed across the department, and it has been changing. We're, we're seeing a uh, a heavy focus on countering hypersonics. You know, if you were to look back uh, two or three years, the focus was on our own offensive capability. Now there's a recognition that because these threats are proliferating, the technology is proliferating, uh, we need to do something about being able to counter. Uh, and really, what that is is to ensure that we've got a deterrence capability available uh, to the department and to our forces. You know, um, I was watching a talk that you gave back in 2017. You were a deputy then. Uh. And your threat slide showed North Korea and Iran. Yes. 
It did not show China. It did not show Russia. Right. Uh, Things have changed. They, they really have. When, when you look at our mission for ballistic missile defense, it is focused on the rogue nations, North Korea and Iran. And so we have a sensor architecture, we have the network capabilities, and we have the engagement capabilities or the weapons to handle those threats to the homeland. When you talk about hypersonics, you can break it up into the homeland threat or the regional threat. And think of regional as the four deployed forces. Um, so when we uh, are designing what we're doing for hypersonics now, the, the big deal is on the regional threat. And so that regional threat can be attributed to the near peers, it can be attributed to anyone else. And so what we want to do is make sure that our forces deployed forward have the protection that they need to do their job. Admiral, you were talking about defending against one missile, two missile coming at us, but what if there's multiples launched against us all at once? Can you defend against that? Uh, we, we can. Um, I, I'll, we talked earlier about where the threat's going. We, we spent some time talking about maneuver and speed. Uh, that is key. But if I add the third, it's raid. And so raid, large numbers. And so that's going to challenge, again, the sensor architecture. It's going to challenge the networks. And it's going to challenge the numbers of weapons that you have to go after those threats. So uh, in limited raid scenarios, uh, we can tackle that. And when you get to very large raids, that really changes the calculus and even the policy associated with missile defense. You were talking earlier about um, space-based sensors. How are you working with Space Force on that? And then there's also the Space Development Agency. How do you work with them? Yeah, so first, uh, Space Development Agency and MDA are underneath the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering. So we're very closely tied together. Uh, in fact, what the Space De uh, Development Agency is, is really focused on is the, what they call the tracking layer. And that's a key piece. You know, think of that as a radar that has a broad view that then cues a more refined radar, which is what HBTSS is. So HBTSS uh, takes you to fire control quality data. What do I mean by that? It's a very tight tolerance around the position, very tight tolerance around the velocity of that incoming threat. So you basically hand off from a large surveillance network to the fire control network. And, and that's, that's what we do with ships, it's what we do with ground systems, and it's what we're going to do with our space systems as well. You know, there's been news uh, recently about um, the U.S. helping the UAE in replenishing um, its missile defense interceptors. Um, that's after Iran-backed Houthis have been launching missiles at them. I, I wonder what you can tell us about how American systems that the UAE has been using have been working. Yeah, first to, to clarify, the UAE is a great partner, and through foreign military sales, they have the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, THAAD. And uh, that was really our first uh, set of operational engagements. All of that went very well, but executed by UAE. This was not a U.S. engagement. It definitely was a U.S. system procured by UAE, and it was very successful. And obviously in the right place at the right time. Because nothing got through, from what I understand. Yes, ma'am. And we're still working uh, with the UAE to analyze that data, because we're always looking for opportunities for that sort of real-world engagement to assess that data and see what improvements might be required in the system. You know, I wonder what other countries you're working with on uh, missile defense capability. What other countries? Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll swing you out to the Pacific. Uh, uh, the uh, country of Japan is, is one of our strongest partners, and they are in a really critical area there. So we work with Japan on sensors. So you may have been tracking the news a few years ago where they uh, wanted to establish two Aegis Ashore sites, north and south on Japan, as their national missile defense. They have since made a decision that they want to move that capability to maneuver assets, and so two larger ships that would then be able to, to move uh, with that large sensor capability. So Japan is a, a key uh, partner there. Uh, then when you swing out uh, to the other side of the world where we were just uh, speaking, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, UAE, and of course Israel, uh, very strong partners there. And then up in uh, Europe, uh, Romania and Poland have two Aegis Ashore sites uh, in the European theater to protect against that rogue threat of Iran as they fly either into Europe or past Europe towards the United States. You mentioned the Aegis. Explain the kind of the triad of missile defense. Sure. Uh, you mean triad? Uh, I, I think of things in a very simple framework of detect, control, engage. So sensors come first. Uh, then it is that control network uh, where you do all of your data fusion and you build the track and you send that and initialize a weapon to get the weapon on target. So those, are, when you say triad, I think mm -hmm. of those three. Uh, and that's really what Aegis is built around. It's the same construct for THAAD. There's a sensor, there's a control system, and then there's a weapon. And it's the same construct uh, for the ground-based mid-course defense where you have sensors on the edge of Alaska, out in the Sea of Japan, and then the control system uh, is in Colorado Springs and we have the launchers uh, there uh, in Alaska. So so it's a distributed system all tied together by something called command control and battle management. 
uh, once you get a, um, once you start tracking the missile and you get that weapon to destroy, intercept and destroy the missile, how do you know that it's been destroyed and that you don't need to launch yet another one at that same missile? Great question. We call that kill assessment, and that's really important for the warfighter. So in a homeland defense mission, what you want to be able to do is to be able to see it from space, the explosion. You want to be able to see from the radar that the track has stopped moving or that you're tracking debris. And that's, that's usually what we need to go from a hit capability to say that it's actually dead. Right? So hit and then kill. And then you know whether or not you need to re-engage. Now, how do you determine what your requirements are for, I mean, does it come from the combatant commands? Does it come from the services? Who tells you, Admiral, this is what we need? Yes, uh, we deliver capability to the services that uh, go to the combatant commands for, for how they use them. So our requirements actually come from both. Uh, so our combatant commands generally will provide us requirements every year. Uh, they are today uh, prioritized by strategic command. Uh, and we'll, we'll get those combatant command level requirements, which, as you would guess, are much broader and larger. Uh, and then we'll have service level requirements that come through the joint process. Admiral, can you give us just a very brief history of the Missile Defense Agency? Sure. Uh, we started as the Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, so you, remember, you might remember SDIO. Uh, and you think about what the mission of that organization was then, it was about the large raid numbers that you mentioned earlier from the Soviet Union. Uh, then we transitioned to the rogue threat um, as we became the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and now we're the agency where we still have the rogue nation ballistic missile defense uh, mission but along with that regional uh, capability that takes us into hypersonic missile defense and cruise missile defense. So wasn't MDA really uh, originally a science and technology agency and has it now really transformed into an acquisition? agency? Uh, I, I would say uh, that we really have transitioned into uh, what I call a development uh, agency, uh, delivering capability uh, to the warfighter. I mean, that is our number one mission. We wake up every morning and we say, how fast can we deliver capability? Now, that includes science and technology. It includes development. It includes going to production. It, can, it uh, includes testing and support to the services. So to you're still sure. doing science and technology? A absolutely. And when we talked about hypersonic uh, uh, earlier, there's a large technology effort uh, within the agency to make sure that we can operate in that new space. Uh, that uh, edge of the atmosphere and into space, that's a different regime than space or in the atmosphere. So we have to have the right technology there. So, you know, uh, MDA sits in the Office of Secretary of Defense. Um, it's not in one of the military services. Yes, what does that mean for your mission? I, I think what it means for our mission is it, it keeps us focused in on missile defense and we're really the only joint acquisition engineering organization that is focused on this mission space. So it allows the nation to have an organization that is focused on the missile defense mission, whether it's ballistic missiles or hypersonics or cruise missile defense. How large is the Missile Defense Agency? How many employees do you have? Yeah, roughly about 8,000 government civilians and a little under 200 military. Is that all here in Washington? Uh, no, our largest footprint is in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, so we're co-located there with NASA and on the Redstone Arsenal uh, with the Army. So that partnership with the Army is really strong. Uh, we have another group down in Dahlgren, Virginia, which is our Navy site, co-located with the Aegis Training Readiness Center and the Naval Surface Warfare Center, then up in Colorado Springs where we do our space uh, work. As of this taping, Admiral, um, we're still operating under a continuing resolution. Has that impacted your mission, your ability to do your work? Uh, continuing re resolutions are always hard. There's never a, a nice way to, to put it. You know, we're, we don't have a budget in 22 yet. We're about halfway through the year. And so when that budget does drop, we're going to be moving very quickly to execute what we said we're going to execute. Uh, the biggest uh, issue for us in the continuing resolution are the new starts. And the new start for us is the defense of Guam. So tell me a little bit more about that. Um, so Defense of Guam, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, back to that detect, control, engage uh, framework, uh, that is what we've been asked to do. Indo-PACOM as a combatant commander set that requirement and we worked within the department uh, to develop the sensor architecture, the networking architecture, and also the, uh, the weapons architecture uh, for the island. And we'll know more as we see the 22 budget and as we get more uh, guidance in the 23 budget. How are you working with uh, private industry in delivering capability? Uh, we have a very close relationship with the private industry. Uh, I, I like to tell everybody we do nothing without industry. Uh, so we have a really great government team. Uh, we leverage the government field, uh, field activities and laboratories. But at the end of the day, uh, we put contracts in place, we build things, we go to production, we put them in the field. 
And then how does it work with, you know, do you always have more than one that you're working on so that there's a bit of competition, so that you're making sure that you're getting the best deal and the best yeah. capability? Absolutely. So I'll just start from the top and work to the bottom just, just real quickly. So when I mentioned the hypersonic ballistic tracking space sensor, two companies, and when we go to Orbit in 23, those are two interoperable satellites that have that fire control capability, but they're built by two different companies with the requirement to be interoperable. That's pretty great. Uh, and then you look at where we are with the ground-based mid-course defense, the homeland defense of the nation. Uh, right now, the next generation interceptor is in a competition. We have two great companies running side by side in a competitive environment through preliminary design all the way up to critical design review. That helps us reduce risk and also make sure that we provide the best capability possible. What would you say is your most challenging technical problem right now? Uh, boy, there are a lot of them, uh, but I would say the, uh, the most challenging ties back to what you mentioned before in RAID uh, and in that new environment of the hypersonic uh, glide vehicle. Uh, that is new and that's where the science and technology investments are being made, that's where development uh, investments are made, and we're working through how we would test that capability. You know, a lot of people have said that we're behind China in hypersonic capability. From your perspective, where do you see the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. So you mentioned earlier, um, and you asked me the question of, you know, what do we think about some of these launches we have seen? So we have the ability, because we're a defense organization, we have the the uh, the defense uh, sensing capability, we have the networking capability, so we can monitor uh, the tests that are being done. And so if I count the numbers, and if you just want to do a numbers comparison, uh, it is impressive uh, what our adversaries are doing versus where we are. So uh, if that's a measure of being behind, I don't know, uh, but uh, I'm not the offensive guy, uh, but uh, I'll tell you that uh, just looking at the data, it is stunning. What do you want our audience to know about our missile defense capability? Um, I want uh, the audience to know that our combatant commands have high confidence in what we're delivering. I have the, the most incredible team out there. We, we, we always say we have a stellar team and we have a noble mission. There's no mission better than protecting the country, and I think we do that well. And if you speak to any of the combatant commanders, they will tell you they have high confidence in the systems that are deployed today, and they're pretty excited about what we're bringing forward in the future. Well, since you're the guy in charge of making sure nothing gets through, I wonder what keeps you up at night. Um, there are a lot of things that keep me up at night. Uh, everything from accidental launch uh, to um, a major failure or the loss of life. I, I always think about that first. And so we, we spend a lot of time in something we call mission assurance. Uh, safety of the soldiers, the sailors, the space uh, guardians, the, the Air Force uh, uh, airmen. Uh, we worry about them all the time because they work around you know, some pretty impressive technology but can also be very dangerous. And so we have to make sure all the safety is employed uh, with those systems. All right. Well, Admiral, nice talking to you. Thank you so much for coming in and, and joining us today. Great, great talking to you. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.